Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple things today. Uh, we're going to talk about Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys. We're going to talk about the cure and the cause, the cause and the cure of the problem of HFT. The, uh, and then we're going to get into something more fun. We're going to play blackjack. We're going to talk about successful strategies in blackjack. And we're also going to talk about how that, a similar strategy, can actually beat the S&P 500. Let's take a look at the um, headlines um, that have occurred. We've all seen this. Uh, HFT has been blamed for everything. Um, there are terrible people out there. Um, the <laughs> uh, this is a um, uh, allegedly profits are being drained and they're being drained by HFT players. We've obviously had a lot of problems with, um, with confidence in our markets. That occurs because of the flash crash, because of glitches that have occurred, and because of two books. Um, now, I think Michael Lewis, we'd all agree that he didn't really understand our industry. He had errors and omissions in what he, was, uh, what he said, but I believe that his message was spot on. I believe it's a tax on everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it costs everybody money to transact business. And our, and our markets have become less efficient because of, um, because of what's going on, and they've become less fair. And so who is collecting the money? This, it's a tax, but who's collecting the money? Let's see who's collecting the money. The 13 exchanges, the 45 dark pools, um, the vendors are collecting the money, and also we all have an increased regulatory requirement as a result. So what's the cause? The cause is, in my opinion, it's Reg NMS. And it's the order protection rule that says that if you have a, if the market's one, two, and I want to bid two, and the two is the two is offered on another exchange, I have to, I can't bid two, I have to take that exchange out first. Uh, this causes us to have to connect to all the exchanges and is a tremendous cost to everyone. Um, I think that Reg NMS created, um, it created competition among exchanges, but it's actually created an oligopoly with high frequency trading firms. I went back and looked at how it was created. It was created with a three to two vote of the commission. Since Cynthia Glassman and Paul Atkins were the dissenters. And in their 40, 44 page dissent, they said the following. They said, we believe the regulation NMS turns back commission policy regarding competition and innovation and sets up roadblocks for our markets. Far from enhancing competition, we believe that Reg NMS will have anti-competitive effects. I spoke to both of them about three weeks ago. Their opinion has not changed. So what's the cure? Uh, the cure, I believe, um, is to essentially rescind Reg NMS. A tamer version of that would be to allow locked markets. Manoj Narong is the first, I think, a number of years ago to recommend this, this approach. He argues that if a two cent, if a one cent wide market is better than a two cent wide market, then a zero spread would be better than a one cent spread. Why shouldn't the public be able to, why shouldn't we have a zero spread market? Actually, Tom Petterfee, who I talked to a number of week, couple weeks ago, uh, who's the CEO of Interactive Brokers, he claimed that he actually spoke to, Mad he said he had talked to Madoff, and I don't know if it was Peter or Bernie, but he said that they argued that we deserved a spread. I don't know that the, our securities industry deserves a spread. Um, I find it interesting that the media, Congress, and the Attorney General from New York blames the high-frequency traders and the exchanges. 
that are just obeying the rules. They're insisting that HFTs and exchanges are breaking the rules, when in fact the rules are broken. So I was thinking, you know, I, 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 think, I think I have this clear vision of this and I think I'm crazy because nobody really understands that. The media, Congress, and the people who are dealing with the issue don't understand. So I think I'm absolutely insane. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of what, why, why, could, why could this be so clear to me? Well, one of the things I've, I've found is that about, only about 20% of our industry has actually read the book. But everybody knows what's in the book because they deal with it every day. But as a friend of mine, Warren Langley, says, it's very difficult to think about the health of the forest when every day you're cutting down trees. And that's what we're doing. Every day we cut down trees. Um, but I was, my insanity, my feeling that I was insane, I'm too old, I should be out of this business. I was fortunately, there was a, uh, an op-ed a couple days ago by Cameron Smith of QuantLab. And he also called for allowing locked markets. So at least I don't think I'm, I'm not, I thought for sure I was insane three days ago, uh, Tuesday I thought, well maybe I'm not completely insane. Um, but I'm hopeful that the media, Congress, uh, will understand and take a more holistic a view, and everybody in this industry will take a whole, more holistic a view to the situation so that we can improve our market structure and we can uh, create a more efficient system and a fairer system. Now, let's go on to something fun. Um, this was my first trading experience. Um, and, and I did have a strategy. My strategy was in a book by Beat the Deal, it's called Beat the Dealer. And this, uh, this originated in 1958 with an academic article. I think many things start in the academic world and then we get, we get those, uh, uh, we, we're the beneficiaries of the academic work. 62, there was a hardback book and then 66, there was a paperback book. And what, um, the first thing they did is they came up with what's the basic strategy. 21's a game that you try to get to 21 without going over. And the question, you have choices. You can hit or stand. You can split two cards that are equal. And you can double down. So it's really a multiple choice question. So what they did is they simulated, they took a full deck, um, and they simulated taking out various cards and figuring out what the best strategy was. Hit, stand, split, or double. And if you know that perfectly, then you're playing the basic strategy. A lot of people think they know the basic strategy, but then if they're tested on it, which I was tested on our t the teams that I played on, we had timed tests. And uh, you really didn't know as much as you thought you knew. So you have to know it perfectly, or at least very close to perfectly. Um, and if you do the basic strategy, you can get an even. You're about even with the house with Las Vegas uh, strip rules. But then if you took out certain cards, Let's assume you, you're, you have a deck and you take out all the aces, suddenly you're playing at a disadvantage. Take out the tens, you're at a disadvantage. But look if you take out all the fives, you're suddenly playing at a 3.29% advantage. And that means that for every $100 you bet, you'd earn $3.29. So if you just run around and look for decks where all the fives are out there, you can, you can play. Well, that's one way to do it. but. Um, Another way would be to separate the cards into the ones that counted positively for you and, and the ones negatively. And the simplest strategy was you take two through six as plus one, seven eights and nines as neutral, and tens and aces as minus one. And you keep a cumulative count of those. When you've got a positive count, you bet the number of units that the count has. So if you have a plus four count, you bet four units. If you have a plus one or less, you bet one unit, or you go to the bathroom. Or you say, I'm not going to play until I get another drink. Um, the, um, or the count approves. The, uh, 
So I played, I played blackjack from 71 to 75 very uh, a lot. And these are some of the numbers that um, um, I played 50 days a year. I had a full-time job, but every chance I was in Las Vegas. Um, that advantage there is .008. I made 80 cents for every $100 I bet. And it's not a perfect system either. Every time the best odds I got were roughly 51-49 or maybe 52-48 in an extreme situation on a hand. But two-thirds of the weekends that I went up, I was able to be successful. But it wasn't a perfect system. This is my second... Uh, Oh, one, one more thing I, I want to say about blackjack. The key was you had to be completely dis disciplined and you had to be, uh, you had to execute this strategy religiously um, and unemotionally. And emotions do, when you're winning and losing, emotions come in. But you had to be completely unemotional. Um, here's my second trading experience. This is the, uh, I actually started on the Pacific Stock Exchange and later moved to the CBOE. Um, but even though I was playing, I was playing blackjack and options, I still had this passion of the market. I thought there was some way to predict the market. And so in 1981, I did some research on a number of indicators to try to see if I could come up with a system uh, where you could buy and sell, I don't know if it was, wasn't the, S, I don't know if it's the S&P 500 or the New York Stock Exchange Index, or I could get a handle on whether the market was going up or down. And I presented a paper at a conference in, actually in Lake Tahoe. Um, and the finding, my findings of, of, on that study were that uh, it is, there's significant potential, but that any strategy you have in playing the S&P 500 would be inferior to the information ratios and the kind of risk on return that I was getting playing blackjack or options. So for the next 18 years, I concentrated on options, and I played some blackjack, too. Here was Hull Trading Company 18 years later. We were operating on 26 exchanges in nine countries, and we'd actually filed an S-1 to go public. But there was, um, there was this firm in New York that wanted to pay a premium for the firm over the IPO price. And we said, well, okay, you can do that. Uh, and that, this is the firm, Goldman Sachs. And they signaled that they were having, they were looking at new ways of trading options futures. And they were looking for an electronic market maker. In the meantime, I had read a book on market timing. And um, this is the book, uh, by Rick Anderson. And one of the things I do when I write, re read an interesting book and something that I find fascinating and I, wanna, I have questions about, I call the author. Authors are, you think, well, why would, you know, he doesn't want to hear from you. Every author loves it that somebody read their book and actually <laughs> is interested in the subject. So, um, and in this case, I actually hired the guy. And he still works for me. He's uh, our chief investment officer. And one of, in 19, in 2006, he said, I've got a strategy that I think we can play the S&P 500. We'll, and I said, okay, you can do it. I wasn't impressed with the strategy, but I said, oh, go ahead. Uh, you can buy or sell 100 S&P 500 futures any day, be long or short, and we'd, he'd change up and down. And so these were the results. In 2006, uh, uh, let's see, 831,000, Trying to look at, uh, but and then the, in sort of interesting, 831,000 in 2009 was the same number. Happened to just happen to be the same number. And that's the good news. And then above in the graph are the daily return, or the I guess those are daily returns. And but that's the good news. We made money. We made money every year. Now the bad news is the strategy is sort of wearing out, and I think the edge in the strategy is gone. So we the weight that we have in our in our actual trading has is, is declined relative to a longer term strategy that I'm going to talk about now. Um, staying close to the academic world, I went to the American Finance Association meeting in Chicago in 2010. 
And there was an article, there was an article that was presented on the Baltic Dry Index. I was fascinated that this academic was convinced that the Baltic Dry Index predicted the S&P 500. How could that be? How could be that happen? And so I did some research. I went and looked at not only um, that article, but about 100 other articles on the subject. And I think I've probably read 150 by now. But here is, here is some, of the, some of the work that uh, uh, was presented. And some of these are going to be very well known to you. Uh, Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner, uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. You see the Baltic Dry Index, new orders, new shipments, consumer price index. You see moving average. If the, if the trend is up, the market tends to continue. If it trends is down, you've heard about all these things. Um, so what we did is we, we said, let's do a walk forward simulation of these not knowing what we, um, and what would happen. So we built a model every two weeks, and we traded. Uh, then we trade 10 days, and we rebuild the model, trade 10 days. And, um, and we were very careful not to have any look forward bias. In fact, in, in some of the cases we would, on the federal, uh, federal Reserve numbers, we actually went back and scrubbed the data by going back and seeing what was reported, not the revised number. The government always goes back and said, well, that number wasn't quite right. So we had to go back through the data to find actually what, what, the, what the real numbers were. And these are the results of the walk forward simulation. Um, the top is the, uh, you can see the equity versus the S&P 500, and you can see down below the position. And I think this graph shows, um, it goes anywhere from, uh, we could be short 100% up to 120% long in this simulation. Notice that it tends to be long most of the time. It's short, it was only max short in 2001 and 2008. Well, let's take a look at the results year by year. Uh, you can see that the sharp ratio, monthly sharp ratio, which we're very, very concerned about is in the point nines, and then uh, the uh, versus the S&P 500. Um, the return was quite, uh, quite good. But if you look at the years, we don't outperform every year. Uh, there are four of nine years that, that we did not outperform. And we should also be aware that these drawdowns that we had in 2001 and 2008 uh, were severe drawdowns. If you look, look, look back at the last 50 years, I believe they were greater than the other drawdowns that we'd had, even including 1987. So let's, um, let's take a look at a daily report. Notice that we have 10 indicators here. Um, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, new orders, new shipments, Baltic dry dollar, consumer price index, the moving average, that's just the trend if it's up or down, sell in May, SIM, sell in May, and the implied correlation. Variables X and Y, we're not going to tell you about those. Um, the, but if you look at this, if you think about this, CAPE is, we're at a slightly higher price to earnings ratio than we historically have been, or have been in the last period that we look at, and that contributes three quarters of a percent. Th these are expect the expected returns over the next six, six or seven months. So it says that that contributes a little bit. That fact alone means that uh, it's slightly bearish. That would be like taking a 10 out of the deck. It's a slightly slight disadvantage. And new orders, new shipments, we, we just went to I think a 4% greater orders than shipments. This is counterintuitive, but when orders exceed shipments, ex returns tend to be lower. In this case, where they are right now, about 1.36% uh, versus uh, if they were even. Baltic Dry, there's been a decline in the Baltic Dry recently. Let's see the dollar. CPI. Um, so you can see each of these, if you looked at uh, variable X and variable Y, variable X looks like its fives are out of the deck, and variable Y looks like tens are out of the deck. And the total 
comes out to be a, an expectation of a half a percent. And this is in excess of what we expect the equity risk premium to be, which would be about 4%. So if we think about this, you'd think about this as a, we would expect the market to be up 4.5% in the next six months. Um, but this, we look at this as being, there are five bullish factors, five bearish factors. I'd say the count's even. The count's even, roughly even. Now let's take a look at what it was a couple months ago. Um, notice that the uh, cyclically adjusted price to range ratio was still negative, but it's more negative to, uh, today than it was then. New orders and shipments were actually bullish, now they're bearish. Um, the other significant change is this consumer price index. I don't know if you've followed those numbers, but uh, we had a little more inflation than we had expected, uh, and it's, it's more approaching um, uh, where it has been in the past. So it was fairly bullish, it's not so bullish now. And that, but, but this said that, at least in April, that we would expect that the um, return would be something like uh, four and a half, four, it'd be something like eight and a half percent in the next six months. Now, if we look back, um, we had 10 indicators before. We got, we have 10 indicators there. Looks sort of like blackjack. Now, for the quants in the audience, uh, what, how did we do this? These are some of the techniques we used. Whoops. Yeah, techniques, okay, okay. These are some of the techniques we've used. You see cross-validation and regularization there. We're very concerned about overfitting. Uh, it's an easy thing to, easy trap to fall into. And these are the techniques that we are not, have fooled around with, but we don't have anything in the system that uses these right now. Now, the question, one of the questions is, is this model complete? No, it's not complete. We're always looking for new indicators. If you have an indicator that you think is, uh, is predicts the S&P 500, uh, please tell me. But we haven't added anything in about the last six months. Nothing is, unfortunately, we haven't come up with anything in the last six months that's added to this long-term model. We're always playing around with the short-term model. That, that's, uh, but uh, the long-term model hasn't changed significantly in the last, we haven't added any new variables. Now, can anybody develop this kind of a model? Yes, you can easily do it. Um, you need to gather, you need to go to a great data source. You need to scrub the data and go back and find the real data uh, as it was reported, not as it was revised. You have to hire two PhDs uh, for a couple years, probably about four man years in, the, in, the, in this project. Um, but most importantly, you have to be disciplined and you have to execute the strategy religiously and unemotionally, just as you would in the game of blackjack. Here's what John Cochran, um, here's what John Cochran is a professor at the University of Chicago. He teaches the advanced investments course there. And this is what he says about Kinds, these kinds of strategies, value strategies, because we're, we have some technical indicators, and, but, but it's really a value strategy that drives it mostly. And it says, following the, these strategies or similar strategies requires a contrarian spirit. You would have missed the 90s bull market, but done well in the bust. You had to buy in the middle of the crash in the winter of 2008-2009. You have to be unpopular. Be able to sit by and watch your buddies get rich and buy when they are selling. You have to buy in the middle of depressions and sell in hot booms. So what are we doing with this strategy today? Well, one, I feel calmer about the prospects of another 2008. We have 10% of our assets in this strategy right now, which will probably increase to 20% shortly. 
But this strategy has capacity. So I'd actually like to let other people use the strategy. And as a result, we are in registration to create an active ETF. In conclusion, we talked about the cause and the cure of the problem of HFT, the cause being Reg NMS and Rule 611, the cure being allowing locked markets. We also talked about blackjack. And if you religiously, if you're disciplined and you religiously execute a strategy, you can win. You can do the same thing in the S&P 500. And I'd like to leave you with one final thought. Just as in the last 30 years, it was considered irresponsible to engage in tactical asset allocation. I believe that in the next 30 years, it will be considered irresponsible if you do not engage in tactical asset allocation. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions if that's yeah, unless, unless you. No, please. I can't take too many questions. I think it's cocktail hour, but I'll take a couple questions. If Wonderful. Great. Thanks. Thank you.